family, today I want to talk about sayings and verses that are commonly taken out of context. If you haven't seen any of my videos, one thing I say time and time again is to pay attention to the context. What does that mean? Basically, when you read God's word, you want to know the who, what, when, where, why, and even the how before making an assumption of what it says. Without doing this, you may be learning a biblical principle incorrectly or spreading misinformation. Now, this doesn't just pertain to reading and studying the Bible. If you're not informed, you may be hearing a sermon, quote, or conversation that takes what the Bible says and twists the meaning or cherry picks what they want you to hear. When it comes to God, the last thing we'd want to do is spread a message that is inspired by the Holy Spirit and ends up being false. That is why the Bible warns us against false teachers. It's also one reason I do my very best through research and prayer to never give you all any information that is not true to the actual meaning of the Bible. Based on what the Bible says, teachers will be judged more harshly. All right. Now that we have the intro out of the way, let's get into this. I will say some of these may be surprising or straight out funny. If it is something that maybe you grew up on learning differently, I do hope that the Holy Spirit uses this video to put it in a perspective for you. Now let's start off with some phrases that you may have heard other people say. Have you ever heard anyone say cleanliness is next to godliness? First of all, this may have been said by many with an OCD of clutter and dirtiness. Someone's got to let the world know how important it is to be clean, right? They just brought up the standards up a notch from regular clean to holy clean. Now, I'm not sure what the difference is, but in case you haven't guessed it already, this is not in the Bible. Oh, this is a popular one. Moderation in all things. This is great for those on a diet, and it's also good if you're the kind of person that spends all of your money on fill in the blank with your favorite hobby, but it says all things. If that's the case, how about when we should give generously or sacrificially, however that may look? What happens if the Holy Spirit moves you to do something that would be above and beyond moderation? Anyways, this is a phrase that while it can help in some areas of your life, it's definitely not biblical. Now let's get into the quotes or principles that are supposedly biblical. Let's start with something you may have learned in Sunday school. Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Now let's think about this for a second. A whale could be big enough to swallow a person. Uh, I'd probably even ask if there were any other fish out there that could have been big enough. Now I'm sure someone's going to stop me right here and throw in the comments that their translation uses the word whale. This is where I beg you to look at the original translation of the word used in Jonah 1.7. It actually just means great fish. While whale may make sense, there might have been another fish that was around during those times, or still around today, that's big enough to swallow a person. Here's another simple one, probably still from Sunday school. Adam and Eve sinned by taking a bite out of the apple. Now hold on, didn't something similar happen to Snow White? Darn those poisonous apples. Now, as much as you may have thought it was an apple, the Bible never said that it was. As a matter of fact, Genesis 3, 6 says that it was a fruit. They could have taken a bite out of a pear, orange, banana, mango, apple, or some other fruit. Does it really matter? No. Although, I may just be curious enough to ask one of them once I get to heaven. How about this one? This too shall pass. If that's not an encouraging quote, I really don't know what is. While it is true that God will take us through storms that we will pass through, I have to ask on behalf of the many martyrs that died for their faith. While technically it did pass for them from humanity to eternity, it certainly didn't help while they were suffering. Also, the Bible does speak positively about suffering and doesn't always speak to it ending while we're still living on earth. Actually, I'd say that the message seems to be more to suffer well than anything else. Hey, at least we know there will be no more suffering once we arrive at our heavenly home. Here's another. God helps those that help themselves. Now this is one convicting sermon, I gotta tell you. You better do your part. If not, God is gonna be leaning back and kicking his feet on top of his golden table until you do something about it. Really? I wouldn't call this quote convicting as much as I would call it hopeless. 
Now, before anyone says anything, let me be the first to tell you, which I've said in previous videos, that faith requires action. It's something that's expected as you grow in your spiritual walk. However, and that's a big however, let me let you in on a little secret you may or may not have known. God can help who he wants, whether or not they'll do anything. I'll wait until the Pharisees are done yelling, blasphemy! Are we ready? Okay. There may be instances where God does wait for us to do our part, but it's not always the case. This isn't black and white. Just remember that God is great enough to make his own choices without us having to intervene. Next one is money is the root of all evil. If I had a nickel for every time I heard this, I'd be a quarter of nickels. Uh, anyways, if this were true, we would all be damned. Technically, it's evil to pay my bills, go on vacations, buy presents for Christmas, and even tithe. Well, it does say that money in general is the root of all evil. How about we go to the verse that all this nonsense actually came from? It's found in 1 Timothy 6.10 and says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Well, that's a lot more than just money is the root of all evil. The key word is love. The love of money is what is evil. The verse doesn't even stop there. Then it explains what it means by love. Now, this makes more sense biblically since the Bible actually talks about how we should spend our money wisely. Hopefully, that's a breath of fresh air for many of you. This next one is probably hanging around your house or office somewhere, and boy is it encouraging. It's found in Philippians 4.13 and says, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. If you notice, this is very different from the ones I've already talked about because it's an actual verse taken from the Bible. The reason I'm including it in the video is because many, and by many, I mean many, people take it out of context. Let me take a quick second to pause and say that I do believe God uses verses to propel us forward and encourage us in our time of need, especially if our situation applies directly to that verse. Now, what did I say in the very beginning that's so important? Context. In order to truly understand this verse, we have to look outside of the verse and read the chapter. But I'll give you the summary. Basically, this was written by Paul to the church of Philippi to show his gratitude and affection for them while he was in prison. Did you get that last part? He was in prison. Prison wasn't a place of comfort. It was intended to hold prisoners, obviously, but also to make them suffer. The mindset of Paul for this chapter, and this verse in particular, was to let others know that in the midst of your suffering, God will strengthen you. This verse is not so you can think that you're capable of any and everything. Regardless of how much you pray, you may not be the next football player, singer, or artist. It's just not what God has put within you to do. Now, if you're in the middle of suffering, however that may look like in your situation, that's where this verse is the most appropriate. This is another popular one. Only God can judge me. Well, if Tupac said it, it must be true, right? First, are we talking about judging before or after death? If after, yes, which is a scary thought, but if before, eh, not so much. First of all, technically anyone can judge you. Second, if the Holy Spirit gives you discernment over false prophets or others' fruits, are you not essentially judging them? Basically, when the Bible tells us not to judge, it's talking about the kind of judging that many people do. Ever had someone look at you and make an assumption or criticize you? Yeah, that's what the context of Matthew 7, 1 through 6 is talking about. You just have to be careful of what kind of judging you do. Now, before I go over this last one, I need to make a disclaimer. I will be making a separate video on this concept with plenty of biblical scripture and an in-depth explanation. This is going to be more of a high-level overview and a brief summary that I'm sure I'm going to repeat in that video. Okay, here it is. Once saved, always saved. I'm curious how many people I lost after saying that. Actually, recently I read of a simple way to understand this. Someone said, no one can take the salvation from you, but you could reject it and lose it that way. 
Without going deeper into it, I think that says a lot to address this popular misconception. I'm curious to know if anyone has any other sayings or verses that are taken out of context. Just let me know in the comment section below. Also, if you want to be notified when I post videos, don't forget to lightly tap on the subscribe button and poke that bell icon. As always, let's finish by praying Psalms 1914 to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Until next time, family, God be with you.